Good, so good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Maya Oswaldic and together with Kai Koyu, uh, we are very happy to finally welcome you to this year's Sliver Lecture Series. We titled the series Architecting Matters and before I introduce today's guest, allow me a few words uh, to frame what is to come. So as the title suggests, we will be orbiting around the word uh, matter, where we took the liberty to playfully jump between different meanings once the word itself is being repositioned and recombined or turned from noun to verb or singular to plural, uh, plural and so on. So furthermore, we are interested in cultural complexities and architecture's operation within it, hence the architecting. Uh, and the series addresses material entangled, uh, sorry, entanglements intertwined with networks of living things. So as design activities or investigations, these engage with matter and matters simultaneously and in various intensities of one or the other. So in a series of four lectures, which you can also see them on the poster over there, we are trying to bridge from material to the immaterial and encompass physical scales and processes beyond the visible, all the way to the immaterial building blocks and operations of the digital realm. And finally, the series also touches on questions such as what is the matter of ideas or what is the matter with ideas and realities we produce. So you see how the world play goes. So today we are very, very happy and have a great pleasure to kick off with Luis Calejas. Luis Calejas is an architect and a co-founder of LCLA office uh, based in uh, Oslo. Uh, which he runs together with uh, Charlotte Hansen. He is currently professor at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design, and his projects and research bridge architecture and landscape architecture. Uh, he taught previously at uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design. He held the Louis Kahn Visiting Chair at Yale, and was uh, the Patrick Geddes Fellow at the University of Edinburgh. In 2013, Louis won the Architecture League of uh, New York Award for Best Young Architects, and the office has been nominated for the Miss van der Rohe Award, the European Architecture, and the Miss Crown Hall Award for Architecture in the Americas. So in 2016, Louis was, on the, uh, was also on the three finalists in the Rolex Mentor and uh, Patronage Program curated by David Chipperfield. So completed works include the open air competition swimming facilities in Medellin uh, for the ninth South American uh, Games and the renovation of the main stadium in Bogota in Colombia. So LCLA office works have been exhibited in, in most major biennales over the past years including the Venice Biennale, the Lisbon Triennale and the Oslo Triennale. Uh, and the Se Seoul Triennale, among others. So, and if I may, if I may, kind of like frame a little bit uh, uh, what's what's coming tonight in the in the under the title of Architecting Matters, and that's a little bit of a claim, so don't don't uh, judge me all too much for it. But I would say, in respect to Architecting Matters, uh, Louis's work is often also a matter of representation specifically in regard to what is decided to be surveyed, made perceivable, and turned into a site for a project. So today, Luis will talk about recent works and persistent inquiries. And without further ado, I'm happy to welcome Luis Calicas. Thank you. <laughs> So I will just start by talking a little bit about the text that you wrote for the series, which was quite provocative. So it's always interesting to think about how these invitations come true, and, and this time it was very precise. <laughs> and um, with, with a text that included a provocation that of course uh, affected the way in which I planned this lecture, so this question of matter that also mentioned live matter was particularly interesting to me. Uh, 
not only because my work also deals with live matter, and by that I mean living things, uh, plants and animals, which is the realm that we often associate with, let's say, landscape architecture. But as an architect, uh, I have been interested in live matter as a media, uh, as a media for design, and that is perhaps what opened this path into landscape very early on in my practice. So. Uh, so, of course, this discussion about what matter is and what is it that matters to us as architects has been very important to the point that uh, in my practice, live matter is, uh, is a media for design. Um, I also feel I have a responsibility of uh, talking a little bit about Latin America because that's where that exploration started many years ago, uh, 2008, when I finished architecture school. And uh, because it's a region of the world that traditionally has been framed as a, as a design culture that is not always completely uh, understood. I think in, in recent years, this design culture has been framed as a kind of very fertile place where there is a lot of intelligence in terms of how to deal with, let's say, social issues and very complex urban situations and so on. But there is also a very refined aesthetic sensitivity that I'm also particularly interested in discussing today because I feel it's somehow underexplored. Uh, but because that's also a very specific aesthetic sensitivity that actually triggers this kind of way of working in between landscape and architecture. So I will speak about the origin of that in my practice. Um, I think it's impossible to speak about landscape as a medium for design without discussing landscape as a kind of uh, idea that is connected to myths of national identity. This is very important in Latin America, as it is all over the world. I will speak about that. I will speak about that land where these design sculptures originated as a land that I like to think it's a land of uh, natural history, not nature. Uh, a land of modernity without modernization in the cultural sense of the world. And I will speak about four projects that I think embody that. <laughs> it's, it, yesterday I was thinking about how to, uh, how to start this, and I did this uh, kind of oversimplified drawing in the hotel. Um, because I guess it's, it's an audience mainly of architects. I'm not sure there are many landscape architects here or any. Uh, so it is important to, to mention that these two disciplines, uh, architecture and landscape architecture, yes, they, they are indeed autonomous, and particularly landscape architecture has fought very hard for its autonomy in different parts of the world. Uh, but these two disciplines, architecture and landscape architecture, in different moments in history, they converge and separate, they converge and separate. And I would like to claim that in the moment where we are right now, they are converging again. And they have been uh, since the 70s, due to the rise of ecology, of a kind of dominant force behind design, and recently because of increased pressure due to climate change. Uh, I don't think this is so different. And again, this is an oversimplification to what has happened between physics and chemistry, let's say which is particularly important maybe to discuss as we are in Vienna. Uh, many of those points of conversion between architecture and, phys and physics, as you probably know better than me, some have happened here. Um, 20th century moments where the two disciplines, people think they kind of converge because something happens and then they separate again. And these are very serious disciplines that are also autonomous, such uh, in the same way that architecture and landscape are. Uh, but I don't mean to claim that architecture and landscape are the same, but when I study architecture, um, the moment when I'm formed as an architect, and I think you are in that moment as well, it's a moment that is relatively long, let's say 20 years, it's one of those points of conversion. That means that I really believe that architects will be naive to ignore some of the, let's say, luggage that comes from the discipline of landscape as something that can be productive. In the same way that landscape architects will be naive at ignoring that some architects are really flirting and playing with their media in very productive ways. Um, so our, our view of nature is only that of nature that we have access to. And by having access to describe it, it is no longer nature. This is not me, this is Simon's camera. 
an art historian that you probably have heard many times uh, that wrote this book called Landscape and Memory, probably one of the best books I can think of to, to think about the idea of landscape. Uh, I bring this up just to start with the idea that uh, nature doesn't exist and is maybe not interested even as a, as a word. Every time we are describing a place, every time that we're building something, we're not dealing with nature anymore. Uh, and landscape, it's inseparable from the production and endurance of national myths against Kama. So how countries and nations see themselves and describe themselves through poetry, literature, law, is uh, very much connected with ideas that are coming from landscape. For instance, again, this is fragments from an interview with Kama. Think about the Dutch making land, asserting themselves in the face of the Spanish Empire, the fear of drowning, geography, moving history, or, German or Germanic cultures, uh, and the forest. Uh, Germanic cultures that I think like to describe culture not as a place transformed, but rather a tribal identity remaining powerful, the forest as the birthplace of culture. In other words, against Roman stone, the land of the wild novels, elevated the forest and saw it as a primordial space of culture. Very different than Rome, obviously. Or the American wilderness as a space for epiphany, rapture, resurrection, the big red trees or the English and the leafy countryside. These are all fragments, again, from an interview. What is, what is interesting, according to Scamma, is that all these myths, when they hit print in the 1500s, they solidified and travel through borders as books for the first time. And this coincides with the foundation of new cities and the discovery of many species in America. As, as you know, America was uh, colonize, uh, or that process started in 1492. Um, that's when the Spanish uh, crossed and came. And the dominant myth in some parts of South America, because of that coincidence of the discovery of species, and, uh, or not discovery, but let's say representation of species to be able to present them back in Europe, uh, was happening at the same time that some of these nations were founded. That means, uh, in my view, this is not Scamma, that for some of these nations, particularly Colombia, uh, naturalism, the natural sciences, are the foundation of this kind of uh, landscape identity myth. Not nature and not religion, as it has been thought, or sometimes is, I think, mistakenly thought. So it's a very sophisticated environment for a uh, nation to start and to think of itself when you have not only uh, colonizers describing the land and founding cities but also naturalists such as Alexander von Humboldt visiting those lands and describing a species that were not described before for Europeans so uh, advancements in representation but also in science uh, moments also where art converged with science uh, happened there this is a representation of Chimborazo a very tall volcano in, uh, in Ecuador where Humboldt and you have probably seen these images a thousand times I hope uh, decided to describe the world of living things particularly plants according to elevation very different than let's say Linneo describing plants according to reproduction um, telling the world, telling Europe uh, that context matters and that plants uh, are located uh, in different parts of a set elevation uh, even though it's tropical and there are no seasons the weather is different because of that elevation so this is very important again for not only for the foundation of this uh, ideas about landscape in, the, in Latin America but also later on for design culture in general, in fact, the school I study. So Latin America, particularly Colombia, is a region that emerges from the myths produced by science and natural history. And this is what I think is important uh, because it's often described as a kind of underdeveloped um, region, but because of this very sophisticated start, uh, it's why these design cultures, I think, uh, can have such a kind of uh, advantage so quickly, especially in the, in the 20th century. Uh, 
So Colombia in particular has been described as the only country in the world which, identi which identity emerges from the tales of natural history. This is not me, it's anthropologist Wade Davis that has, uh, it's probably the anthropologist that has studied uh, more this, uh, the rise of this myth in, in Latin America. And then we also have this extreme abstraction of the grid and the, the so-called law of the Indies that came from Spain. There was no medieval city, uh, so these two things collide, natural history and cities that were founded with abstract grids all over the territory. So the founding of the cities was ordered by law, the law of the Indies, which was an instrument that established authority and administrative power over the territory and its resources. Cities were organized according to a pre-established plan conceiving the abstract space of the law and never drawn a priori, formally a priori. It was grids that expanded from a central plaza around which was to be located the three powers of authority. It is Anita de Risbeti, a landscape, <coughs> landscape uh, architect and historian. So basically, just to cut it short, every point that you see there with some light in Latin America whether it's Brazil or Argentina or Colombia or Venezuela, very much started like this. Some of them coincided with pre-Columbian set uh, settlements, but the big expansion of the cities really happened due to the implementation of the Indies chart and this very abstract model, which is the, the radical abstraction of the grid on the territory. So cities and landscapes in Latin America are the result of three direct, three distinct interrelated processes. The first, the physical geography, of course. It continues to be fundamental to the territorial organization, the cultural diversity and its position as a major source of minerals, metals, hydrocarbons for global market. The second, a historical one, is that Latin America went through a process of colonization that was distinctly different from others. It was one that implanted an extensive network of cities and a tradition of cultural hybridization, uh, both still over operative today. The third, a socioeconomic one, and one of the most rehearsed hypotheses in Latin American culture, and is that there was, or there has been, fully developed modernism in the cultural sense of the world, of the world, but without full modernization in the economic sense of the term. Again, Anita Resbetia. So. Modern art, modern culture was fully implemented, but socioeconomic, um, particularly economic reasons, didn't allow for a full implementation of the process of modernization. Another image that clarifies this and is very strong, which is uh, uh, Le Corbusier landing in, uh, in Buenos Aires. And instead of being confronted with Buenos Aires as a, as a medieval city, which is not, which will have been the case in Europe, most likely. His idea for a master plan had to be in dialogue with the abstraction of the grid. So this was like the kind of perfect laboratory for someone like Le Corbusier <laughs> uh, that was dealing basically with the beautiful landscape, the radical abstraction of the grid, and his own radical abstraction. These things converge in Latin America and produce something uh, very fertile at that time. That's why Latin America in many cases and many historians presented as a kind of ideal laboratory for this. Uh, and then landscape, not only the radical grid. Landscape is another lens through which one can understand the evolution of the Latin American city. Nature in the New World has been the object of amazement and astonishment for Europeans from the start. The chronicles of the first Spanish colonies are filled with descriptions of plants, vegetation, fruits, indigenous people. However, the Latin American city remained a cleared space, literally and metaphorically, of colonization. Uh, treeless and austere, it stood in stark contrast with exuberant nature pressing against it, its edges. Landscape as cultivated nature did not become integrated into the physical environment of the city until the second half of the 19th century, very different from Europe. Uh, and this is when the discourse of modern science was again overlapped with, with, um, with all this. Uh, France and Germany sponsor expeditions to gain knowledge and, uh, and access over the resources previously monopolized by Spain. Uh, 
scientist, naturalist, and explorer mapped and described almost the entire spectrum of natural phenomena and collected specimens of flora and fauna for museums, herbariums, botanical gardens around the world, from Madrid to St. Petersburg. Romantic painters and travelers extensively recorded Latin American natural culture and urban landscapes. These images of objective nature, devoid of all Spanish or religious traces, were significant because in their appreciation of native landscape, they reaffirmed the political aspirations of the new republics, uh, freedom. In the late 19th century, Latin America, um, enlightenment values, post-independence liberal ideology, and European commerce were in perfect alignment. Again, uh, Anita Arisbetia. One example, this is from the so-called Hudson School of Painting. Um, this was really in North America, not South America, uh, obviously with some roots in, in uh, Dutch and Flemish painting. But what is the difference with the European counterpart of this painting school? And is that they were not only attempting to be realistic in terms of how to depict the atmospherical conditions of those landscapes, they also were trying to be botanically accurate. So many of the paintings that are attributed to this school the Hudson School of Painting, they were kind of inheriting this tradition from these drawings from Humboldt and so on. So a botanist could look into one of those paintings, zoom in and almost pinpoint and recognize the plants. If there was exaggeration in the representation of the atmosphere, there was precision in the representation of the plants, which is uh, really fantastic and something that really started in, uh, in America. Uh, this is probably one of the first times I bring my own work. This is an early sketch for a greenhouse in, in Bogota when I was looking at some of these drawings by Humboldt and actually trying to understand which of these plants indeed need a space that is inside or outside. So, again, uh, plants are not nature. In Latin America and even before uh, the Spanish came, plants are culture and plants are technology. Medicine, magic, uh, magic is magic plants such as mushrooms and so on. They are nothing else than technologies that allow these cultures also to connect with the world in a different way. So there is a sophistication also in that sense. Again, Le Corbusier commissioned with the plan to, to design uh, part of Bogota, a very large part. The reason this plan is important uh, is that it has been described by some, part, uh, I think the, the last one I've heard was Hashim Sarkis, that really likes to think about uh, that moment when Le Corbusier gets this plan as the kind of early rise of uh, landscape urbanism. It's a very provocative idea. One of the first times that apparently he recognized that in the absence of, let's say, valuable buildings, the figure of the mountains, the creek, the river, and the green structure of the city was much more potent than built form and buildings. So very different than previous plans by Corbusier. Uh, the green structure is taking the lead and guiding the plan. Uh, same thing happened basically in the plan for Medellin by Jose Luis Sert. Uh, they were very close at that time. So the promises of modernity match the traditions of natural history giving rise to a unique and sophisticated design culture. That's, I, I took too long for what was supposed to be a kind of side idea, but <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, this is that sophisticated design culture. Robert Burle Marx, uh, designer of landscapes, uh, landscapes that were not following the canons from the English tradition, nor the French, it was a new thing. This was new. Um, there was no need to follow these traditions because there was, they never landed before, actually. Uh, Sergio Bernardes dreaming about designing not only networks of airport cities, but also even designing airplanes. Um, and now I'm jumping to Europe again, and the myth of the forest. So how someone like me and our studio that is kind of, again, originates in, in that context, deals with problems outside of it. It's interesting because now I'm in Oslo, which is more, is of course, closer to the kind of Germanic myth in which the forest is kind of very, very important. And um, 
it's also the school where I'm teaching, you know, like uh, Christian Norbert Schulz, Berrafen, Genius Lokai, all that stuff, which is basically that you will kind of listen to the landscape and wait for the landscape to tell you what to do. That's, that's that context. Uh, and I, and I, I liked to challenge that idea. This is a forest clearing in Norway, uh, very close to the city, a few kilometers from the city. It looks like a, it's obviously beautiful, but uh, from the perspective of a kind of ground-based photography looks, now maybe not so different than a forest clearing somewhere else in Finland or Sweden or Canada. Uh, obviously, this archetype of the clearing has been very important for uh, Germanic uh, design culture. Uh, and I think this is very known to you. <laughs> I mean, the idea that this space can engender an architectural idea, this is something very much uh, kind of rooted in that, in that context. On the other hand, you have the French, which is, uh, in my view, equally interesting, which is the idea that you can actually invent the clearing. This is Le Notre, uh, the designer of the gardens of Versailles, inventing this absent space in a kind of uh, invented forest, which is really not a forest, but it's the idea that using architectural codes and aesthetics and geometries, you can produce a space with the proportions and dimensions, perhaps of a cathedral that is basically an absence of trees. These are the bosquets of the gardens of Versailles, very abstract, and uh, not relying on a natural forest. So these are these kind of two worlds that I'm interested in there, or artists that have also worked with the idea of producing space by subtracting a vegetated mass. This is Jan David. Or even examples in Scandinavia, such as um, Asplund and Leverens. I love this photo, because this hill that nowadays looks like it's natural, it's actually not natural. And this is when it was being planted. It's a, it's a photo during the construction of the Woodland Cemetery. It looks like a ziggurat, and you see you, you, you can read and understand that this is a kind of, there is an architecture to that landscape structure. <coughs> anyway, uh, what's particularly interesting about Norway is that this forest is surveyed uh, with a level of detail that is very high, one of the highest in the world. Uh, there is a track of every single tree uh, done through LIDAR, uh, you know, a laser that shoots down, bounces back. Uh, 20 points per square meter, and that gives you basically a 3D model, uh, or can be transformed in a 3D model that calculates peaks and valleys and that gives you tree by tree. And it was in that space of the survey, not walking, that, that I discover that the clearings in Oslo are very different than in Finland, in Sweden, in Canada, anywhere where there are clearings. They have very quirky strange geometries. And interestingly, no one has been looking at this. Uh, these geometries are beautiful, formally, <laughs> I think. Uh, this is uh, an image from an exhibition long ago, uh, where we do it in wool. But why is it that Norway has these clearings with these beautiful shapes, and why is it that they had not been looked at before? So I don't think they have been looked at because architects are often paying too much attention to the experience on site. This is information that existed in the space of the survey, or the landscape of the data, basically, which can also be kind of evaluated poetically and aesthetically. And, um, and obviously different practices, cultural practices for forestry that are very sophisticated in Norway, and particularly close to Oslo, that mandate foresters to avoid straight lines to avoid uh, monocultures close to lakes and paths, uh, to avoid cutting the tree down all the way down to the ground in order to increase biodiversity and so on. Interestingly, these techniques are not emerging because of ecology. Recently, they support ecology, but they emerged because of what they wanted was to perpetuate a kind of romantic, Germanic, styling the idea that the forest is an artificial space. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, Alto's father was a forester. This is drawn by Alvar Alto. It's a pity that you don't see the credits are there. It's not that I didn't place them. <laughs> so this is Alvar Alto, not me. Uh, uh, precise. I will have to go faster. <laughs> 
But anyway, this is drawings by me, drawings by Andrea Branci. Uh, it's a book that I did with Andrea Branci recently, where I take my drawings of the clearings on the three-dimensional survey. I suggest additions to those clearings to suggest that they can be civic spaces, such as plazas and boulevards, because they are, I think, indeed more interesting than plazas and boulevards in central Oslo. And I use Branci's drawings, which is a previously unedited, previously um, unpublished series that he did called Enclosures to speculate what could be the kind of architecture in the limits of those clearings. This is a collection of such clearings. And this is the survey. This is the space of the data. This is essentially after those clearings are edited and those editions are loaded again into the 3D model. These clearings are editing, edited, like editing a text to clarify the shape. And by the way, this is only applied to the clearings that have similar dimensions to the, uh, um, to the enclosures that Le Notre designed for Versailles. That's a kind of provocation, that, that there is a kind of uh, uh, bosquet similar to Versailles in dimensions in the forest that is hidden there, that no one has seen, that all it needs is a little bit of formal clarification. I will switch to Latin America again. Uh, a project uh, in the Andes, in the middle of the Andes, in Colombia, 400 kilometers from the ocean. This is Medellin, it's a deep valley, 26, 26 kilometers. Uh, the difference between the high point and the low point, it's, it's about a thousand meters. So it's a very deep valley with four million people living in it, uh, completely urbanized. It's a city that cannot grow anymore. Um, it's constrained by geography. Uh, so it's dense and it's becoming denser and denser with a river flowing through the middle. Um, the low point is 1,500 meters above sea level. What, I, what is interesting about this is that 70% of areas uh, where buildings are built in Medellin are in slopes. So getting a flat site is a kind of exception. In, in fact, you, when you're in architecture school, you never assume you will get a flat site. It's a bit like studying in Switzerland or, you know, you always get this kind of... Uh, so we, it's kind of in our DNA. And, and we got this flat site for our first project. Also in a very strange commission. Can I lower this? It's fine. <laughs> I promise that I credit everyone, but it's always there, so... <laughs> anyway, uh, it was a very strange brief for a competition because they wanted a new swimming facility and this was right after the Olympic Games in Beijing and uh, when we got the brief we realized that it was probably based on the water cube. It was almost like a copy paste of the brief. It was, it's not a, it was not a bad idea to do that, it was a good brief. The problem with that brief is that it requests an enclosed building with an enclosed atmosphere which is not necessary in Medellin. Medellin is a city that has between 21 to 25 degrees in temperature all year round, very stable. And what that means is that uh, there are many open air recreational facilities for swimming, but very few cities in the world that have such a, st a stable temperature, what they allow is that you can actually do uh, professional competitions. You can qualify for the Olympics in an open air pool in Medellin, which is very rare because you need a range of temperature that is very precise. So that's why many professional facilities where records are official and these kind of things, they, they are buildings, not open air facilities. But of course, at that time, I was more interested in stuff like this, like what you see on the right, that's the Bellinzona bathhouse by Galfetti, where architecture, rather than being an enclosure, is more a kind of a infrastructure that connects landscape events. That are, that are distant from each other. And those landscape events are uh, sometimes landforms, gardens, uh, pools. I was very interested in how to do that, but not for recreation, but for competitions. Also very interested in Australia, a culture in which swimming is like football for <laughs> Colombians. And this beautiful network of pools uh, by the ocean uh, they are not built by architects, 
but uh, we always saw this as a sort of alphabet of formal operations in order to deal with the, with the coast. Uh, some of them are more geometric, others are more precarious, some of them are more solid, like this one, the iceberg pools. It's my own photography, by the way, which is also very important to how we work. Uh, these photographs often end up in the collage, and this is very much also how the office started. Um, swimming at night in Australia, uh, visiting some of these pools. This is what I said before. Some of them are actually very precarious, just simple enclosures. But what is interesting is not reading them as individual pools, but as a kind of intelligence of formal operations that could be read as a kind of alphabet to deal with different coastal conditions. And we kind of wanted that. And, and that's, that's how it started, how to deal with this strange plot, flat, in a very difficult place in the center of the city that couldn't be farther from the ocean. Again, this is 400 kilometers from the sea. Hoping that having water and pools for swimming will also kind of activate this in a, in a kind of urban sense. Uh, and also by not doing the building, in, in the sense not, not building the roof, we could do two more pools, one for kids and one for training. And this could become or behave like a park, uh, or like a park-like space when there are no games happening. The black ones are the old pools from the 70s. And our, play, our site used to be a racing cart track. It's a, it's a system that is actually quite simple, even though the geometry is kind of convoluted because of the, you cannot modify the geometry of the pools. And every time we drop them there, we ended up with these triangles. But it's gardens that surround pools. We are not doing a roof or wall, so we have to dig. And by digging, we create courtyards. The swimmers meet in the courtyards. And then there are these ramps that take the swimmers into the pools. And then this is how the basements look. So spaces that are very banal, such as uh, filters, technical areas, areas for the press. They have a geometry that obey the logic of how we want the garden to be in the surface. So it's, it's a kind of complex geometric exercise that looks complex, but because it's landscape, nothing is too tall. So complex geometries, they don't manifest themselves uh, as they do often with architecture. Uh, so sometimes some of these lines are just a bench. Um, except in this area. That's the only building that we wanted, which is the entrance that also serves as the steps for the synchronized swimming pool. So it's a project with a complex plan, but a simple section of excavations where differences in levels allow uh, privacy, some privacy, even though it's all open air for swimmers and competitors. Um, and then the gardens, when they grow, they provide the, a, a degree of privacy uh, that we thought we would be disqualified. If we were. Again, this is not a competition for a landscape. So we had to respond to an architectural brief with a landscape response, but we still had, it was a competition. So we still have to solve everything. Um, and and the, lab, the architectural brief is compartmentalized. So these divisions for us, instead of walls, we use gardens. And these gardens can be thick, while a wall is generally thinner. Uh, we probably won also because we provided this big space, uh, as we got rid of all that other stuff, that could be used as a street. And that street, uh, or sidewalk, is much more interesting than the sidewalk outside, in an area that was also quite dangerous at that time. And we had this intuition that if we don't build the steps, because no one watches uh, swimming, <laughs> everybody's watching football, uh, we thought it was stupid to build the steps. And we suggested as a kind of uh, trick, competition trick, that this space was for rental steps. But when there is not a game happening, this is a public space. Um, so we can suggest that the director of this facility is a public facility, can open both sides, and then people can walk through it rather than outside and see people swimming and so on. So it's a, it's a kind of public space project, really. Uh, but also other groups of swimmers, maybe uh, non-competitive, <laughs> are also invited and have their own pool, which was important. 
So these two worlds are combined, which is also a kind of problem of sports facilities. The competitive world with the recreational, even therapeutic part. And everything that is architecture happens three meters below in these spaces that also have gardens, that also have plants, and that have plants that like that condition. So these thick, big leaves that like partial shadow. This is the street that I was mentioning. So obviously it became more interesting to walk here in these wide streets, the, in some parts it's as wide as the Highland in New York, by the plants and by the pools than walking in the narrow sidewalk. It's a very dense city. Uh, you can see the pools in the bottom, bottom left. Uh, there was a creek with water. Um, uh, polluted. We thought we could use that water for the pools. It was probably a naive idea for the competition, but helped. Um, but we, we still think that symbolically, at least, having the water as pools, open air, is a kind of manifestation or public aspiration of that creek to become again a kind of uh, public water, even though it's still very, very much polluted. And then architecture, as I like, uh, I'm not so interested in typology, it's, or, the, or recognizing a kind of use. And, and, and at, that, at that time, we were very interested in whatever architecture we did in the, to be something that you could confuse by a kind of roadside structure, or even a bridge, or, a, or an underpass. So, program in this case is the most banal program, and smallest, like the infirmary, the, some offices, the storage, serving as a structure for this elevated platform and the steps to look into the synchronized swimming facility. So it's a very big building that is not dense in terms of program, very transparent, that, that is not giving away its use or what it is. Uh, some say it's very brutal, and maybe it is. Uh, but what is interesting is this kind of architecture that is difficult to recognize or to describe it's important in order to reinforce the landscape as something important and symbolic and iconic. And this is something that is very important for our projects. Uh, it's a project of a lot of circulation. It's not efficient. Swimmers love it and hate it because they have to walk a lot to go to the pool in between the bathrooms and dressing rooms, but they're walking in between plants and gardens, um, which is good. And, and of course, there is a sculptural ambition behind these projects. It's not all infrastructural or functional. And uh, so the moments where architecture is allowed to be extruded high up from the ground, uh, there is some kind of both a structural and a sculptural experiment happening. This is all something that happens in most of our projects that is completely independent from program. Again, this is the steps, this is the ramps that takes you to the steps, and this is the slab that supports the public platform. But again, these are shapes that are intentionally uh, completely separated from the kind of reading of this public building. Um, this is the synchronized swimming pool. It's the opposite situation as the courtyards. In this case, the platform is elevated, it's not sunken. But what is happening here is the same. The swimmers take the ramp, they meet as they do in that photo, in this triangular space. That's where they talk with the trainer, discuss what they are going to do and then they take the other ramp in order to swim. And this is the only one that is more like a plinth in the synchronized swimming pool. Um, we learned that they, this is probably the only sport that has a kind of interesting audience and a fan base because it's more like a dance or theater rather than a sport. So we decided to elevate it and expose that kind of underwater landscape to the most public part of the street. Uh, in order to attract people, basically, and have this public space in contact with this very intimate world of synchronized swimming, which is quite beautiful. And that's why we opened windows in the pool towards the most public part. I, think I still have a little bit of time, right? <laughs> I'll go quickly through this. I'm switching to the desert, and this is Kuwait. Uh, in the same way that questioning the forest or the Andes, um, and this is in the middle of COVID, these two projects that I'm going to show. 
uh, invited to, su to suggest a project for Kuwait, a uh, country that I had not visited before, I still have not visited. And, uh, and the curators uh, instigated a, a kind of provocation, which is, why don't you work with the idea of the desert of Kuwait as a landscape that has been mediated by images. And, and, and this felt very close to me because I was a, a kid, teenager in the 90s. So obviously images of Desert Storm, the first, um, you know, when Iraq invaded Kuwait and then when Americans went there and all these images of this kind of first war that was really uh, stream and TV and uh, CNN and so on. Those images are still very present for my generation, maybe less so for yours, but it is this generation that at that time was kind of, uh, for the first time, maybe thinking about war and, and having these images in TV. And this was important because, again, it was COVID time, we couldn't visit, and I was very interested in criticizing and challenge the idea that, as I said at the beginning, landscapes are the myths that we create around them. And, and in Kuwait, uh, sadly, and this is a myth that I think is changing, but very slowly, it's a, it's a landscape that is still mediated by those images. Um, the term sandbox here is important. Uh, I was interested in the violence of that term. I'll give you two examples. In, in software development, sandbox is used as a kind of slang to describe an environment of untested code. And for the American army, uh, they used to use it, I don't know if they still do, as a slang to describe the desert war theater anywhere, regardless of geographic location. They just call it the sandbox. Um, very dramatic images, of course. Uh, you probably have seen many of those. And it is a kind of archetypal desert. Kuwait, in the sense that it's relatively flat, or very flat, very little vegetation. It's like the desert that you would imagine if you think about the word desert. So I was also kind of interested in that idea of the archetype, which is kind of how we thought young soldiers were picturing that space when they were given maps and images, when they were about to go to Kuwait in airplanes and tanks and so on. So how do they read such an abstract space that is so flat with so little references? This is coming from the curators, not by me. They were interested in, in kind of elevating some cultural landscapes that have been overlooked. For instance, there, there is indeed a camping remnants. Uh, people like to camp in the desert. There are archaeological sites that are very flat that, are, that have been tracked, but it's not how we think about Kuwait. When we think about Kuwait, there is sand destruction, there is military sites. That's a tire graveyard, the largest in the world. These are car tires. So there's always these fascinating patterns in Kuwait that the curators were interested in elevating for the Biennale. And they wanted us to work with that. I have been very interested, for instance, in this uh, Lucia Le uh, historian. She did this beautiful book where she looks at how art historians, actually when they, American mainly, <laughs> they were very worried that because the English were going to be basically, they were in a lot more danger in the Second World War than the Americans. They were very worried that the bombing campaign in Europe will end up in monuments being destroyed, including in, possibly in Italy, obviously in Germany. So and the Americans had this task force that was in charge of um, thinking how through precision bombing uh, help initially the British and then themselves not to basically to tell pilots what not to bomb and how to think what a monument is and so on. And, and this is something that they didn't have to do when they went to Kuwait. Uh, this is an image that you probably have seen many times. This is. Uh, Man Rai, uh, that photograph an artwork by Marcel Duchamp. Um, this artwork was collecting dust for a year, <laughs> and those particles of dust became something new. So as is the picture by Man Rai, by the way. Um, the artwork by Duchamp, you see some traces. This is done, I think it's 1929, if I'm not mistaken. 
So aerial photography was relatively new. Um, Man Ray and Duchamp were very quick at relating these images to a kind of aerial photograph. Maybe the gardens of Versailles, maybe somewhere. And, um, and later, when Sophie Rieselhuber, German photographer, Swiss, I'm not sure, this I'm not completely sure, uh, visited uh, Kuwait uh, not as an artist, but as a war journalist, and saw it from the air, and saw these terrible scars of war after, right after Desert Storm, and she was documenting, she was not making art. Uh, she saw a parallel between her own images back in the lab and the similarity between these images and, and Man Rai's piece. Uh, where those lines are scars of war, and there is a kind of very extreme violence in that abstraction of the desert that I was interested to discuss also with the curators, which is if even art history has kind of, it has a tradition of creating these violent abstractions of the desert to the point that these situations happen, what would be the next step after that in order to, through images and art, elevate those cultural landscapes that they are interested in. So I took the images, uh, corrected the perspective, both Man Rice and Riesel Hoover, started to zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, until it's not possible to zoom in anymore, and try to see what is there, a speck, a speck of dust, <laughs> uh, some lint, hair, uh, and, uh, and mold that. Similar techniques as we use in the forest. Um, this is basically a height field. Try to invent the resolution of the image that doesn't exist, but can be interpolated and to some extent even invented to instigate the question of what kind of architecture can these lines and points and dust be if they are not the scars of war. Um, this has to be helped also through a process that is by hand, it's not only computation. When you start to guess what kind of architecture this wants to be, and some of these shapes, you start to imagine what they can be in relationship to, to what the curators are describing as interesting cultural landscapes. So this is the new image. This is actually a fragment, very tiny fragment, of what I consider the third piece in that dialogue between the piece by Man Rai Rizal, who were an art piece in which these scars of war starts to become a kind of proto-architecture. Uh, it's a simulation, it's 16 million particles, that's the settling dust, landing on top of these forms that start to become some kind of architecture that is not uh, scars of wars, but cultural landscapes, such as the camel racing track, for instance, which is indeed something that they do in the desert. Uh, or strange excavated architectures that are not trenches, but rather uh, spaces to... Uh, there are open-air mosques, for example, which is quite interesting, uh, somewhere between furniture and... and <laughs> here you can see a little bit of the detail of how this uh, kind of digital dust settles on the image. So these are all fragments, or the sheep, the dust from the image that became sheep. Uh, there are rich cultural practices happening in that landscape, but it has to be true questioning the image and how these images have been presented. So that was what we deliver. Um, and as you start to add and add detail, uh, they, it starts to look more like architecture and, and less like uh, scars of war. Um, some get quite deformed and those deformations are interesting too, when the, dust, the dust uh, settles even more. And I will end with Medellin again, or not Medellin, but another clearing, but at this time not in Norway, but Colombia. Uh, this is not nature, but people love to call this nature. Uh, it's, it's beautiful indeed. This is the top part of the valley, by the way. It's an area where there is a lot of second homes, uh, vacation homes, uh, people that have a second house, uh, that love to describe this as nature, but what you see here is a landscape where there has been cows. Uh, therefore, it has suffered greatly. It has been compacted by the cows. The cows eat grass, and this is an area that is not 
natural for cattle. Uh, so indeed, this grass is mainly an Australian grass that is extremely invasive, and it's a monoculture of grass. There is probably more biodiversity in this floor than in that grass. Uh, you cannot plant a garden there. It cannot outcompete that grass. And then the trees is a mix of uh, pines from Canada, eucalyptus from Australia, uh, trees that have been brought at different times. It's, it's now naturalized in the sense that it's not new. It's been 80 years of uh, bringing new trees, but they make the soil very acidic, so their native trees struggle a lot to grow. So this forest clearing cannot be more different than nature. And this was important in order to discuss with our client that in order to make architecture there, uh, we needed to downscale. We needed to make a house smaller and fragmented and deal with the landscape as a kind of architectural problem in the sense that it deserves budget, time, and to make a decent garden there is also a technical problem. So we also like to think that the whole clearing is the house, not just the little pieces. Um, we decided to fragment the house initially in two and to position it in the, in the most difficult topography, uh, most steep. And to, again, it's basically to deviate resources from architecture in terms of money, time, budget, energy from us, energy from the client, reduce the commission of architecture in terms of square meters. Uh, this is not minimal living, <laughs> it's not cabins. This could have been a 400 square meter house and became two pieces of 60 square meters each. But not because we are convincing the client that they can live small, it's because we are convincing the client that the task is the whole site and we need to think of the site as the whole. Obviously this is easier in the tropics. So that beautiful clearing, it's an artificial space that needs some remediation. It needs new trees, this, we need to deal with this grass. And then in this process, we can plan also an architecture that, that enjoys that process of transforming that landscape. Um, how to enjoy that landscape? And if you're going to build two pieces, it was very important. One is uh, half sunken, one is elevated from the terrain. But both have similar surface area, similar material, similar everyone, all of them, both of them have a kitchen, a bathroom, and so on. Uh, but one is long and sunken, one is square and elevated. The idea here is that you can choose, depending on the season, the time, uh, most likely the one that is excavated is a little bit more humid, it's more cave-like, while the one that is elevated is more extroverted. Very important in, in our work, uh, this, this word I know exists in German, I won't dare to say it, but I know that there's, you know, there's the wet works and the dry works. The work, wet works is the structures, uh, pouring stuff is messy, and then the dry works is all this world of uh, drywall and interiors and carpets and so on. What we did with this project, as with many projects, is to skip completely the dry works and not for the sake of a kind of brutalistic aesthetic as, that I think is kind of also interesting in Latin America to discuss it. There are fantastic architects that have done it, such as Lina Bobardi or Paulo Mendes da Rocha in Brazil. It's not that approach. It's basically to deviate those resources, and by that, I, again, I mean money, time, hours, to use that into the design of the garden. This decision is very important because of our, also because of a pragmatic Thing, which is that gardens are very badly paid, <laughs> uh, especially in Latin America. So if you want to put a lot of energy into it, you need to take, you need to steal that money from somewhere in the architectural commission. And for us, it's the dry works. The landscape, it's, uh, it's like an artwork. It's very inventive in the sense that if this site is not natural, let's make a landscape that is even less natural and even more absurd. Uh, Humboldt's drawing. This line is 3,000 meters elevation. Our site is 2,100. And we want to make a garden that looks grow lower. But also it's not possible to build architecture here because this is protected lands. Everything at that altitude most likely is protected. So how do you do a garden that looks like this fantastic landscape at a lower altitude? It was about using plants that look like other plants. 
it's a kind of postmodern garden in that sense. Uh, it's not about the precision of the plant selection. It's about choosing banal plants that look like those, but also because this landscape is kind of foggy and cold. This whole atmosphere might look like a paramo if you do it well. Um, those are the plants. So it's a, it's a kind of very... It, it takes time, and that's what I mean. It's important to take the... to just forget about the interiors and focus on that. Uh, and hope uh, that this will qualify architecture in a better way than interior design. Um, again, as I mentioned, one structure is elevated in a single cross-shaped column. That's the one on the right. And the other structure is a retention wall parallel to the contours. Um, similar surface area. Removing the Australian grass Sometimes even takes fire, actually, because you need to burn the spores and so on, the seeds. Uh, and then the clearing, which is kind of, again, this is pines that were, it's mainly Canadian pines, like patula pine, they call it. Um, and again, like the project uh, of the pool, it's very important that architecture remains very abstract, that you don't see this thing and think, oh, this is a house, it's a retention wall, and it's on a shame of looking like, like a retention wall. It's partially sunken, uh, and we do what I like to think of it as a kind of Latin trick, which is that uh, you sunk architecture a little bit, but plants will grow, and you can use plants almost as if it's topography, because there's no winter, it remains lush all year. This is something we learned from Roberto Urlemarx, of course. And from the neighbor's perspective, this long house maybe looks like a water tank, which there are some. Um, and it's a little bit mysterious in the sense that you, you don't know what it is. And of, obviously the garden has much more presence. That's the plant actually that we thought is a kind of, it's a palma yuca, one of the cheapest plants you can get. Um, and you see that there's a lot of attention basically put into the garden and how that garden softens the presence of those buildings that are indeed very abstract and simple. Uh, the edge of the clearing is edited. Some spaces are open. This project is happening at the same time I'm doing the first project in Oslo, which is a kind of more academic project, but I'm also testing some of those editions on the site. So it's not like these operations belong to a specific location. Again, this is not about site specificity. So what we are learning from Oslo is being applied in Colombia, uh, brutally. Uh, in, in that sense, context doesn't matter much. It's more about spatial ideas. So the edge is edited, it's clarified, some trees are removed, uh, some trees that are old need to be replaced by others. There are decisions such as this one. Uh, it's very obvious that these stairs, these steps are orientated towards one of the oldest pines. Uh, but pines in the tropics, in, they die very fast because they are not as good as in Europe. They, in, in northern Europe, there is winter, so the wood gets harder, it's lower. Uh, often these kind of pines in Colombia, they grow very, very fast and they are very weak. They can be taken down by the wind. Uh, so there, there's not many years left <laughs> for that tree. Maybe five, maybe ten. Maybe we'll die tomorrow because of a wind. So it's very important to think which tree will replace that tree because an architectural decision was taken based on the presence of that tree. So we are already planting trees that are going to replace the ones that will die. Uh, this again is different than a kind of, let's say, traditional uh, garden, uh, garden commission. And spaces such as the kitchen, or this is again sunken, orientated towards a garden with herbs, mainly rosemary. It's a kind of cave-like space. Uh, uh, the problem there is not the weather barrier, it's the earthquakes. So a structure, uh, and the structure is, gives presence to the building. And the only details that we think are maybe important are the details in metal, in stainless steel. Uh, such as this little uh, space for the bathroom. The shower is open. It's a house where you can have breakfast in the shower. Um, it, it's, it's 
is trying hard not to look small. And in order to do that, there are some sacrifices to be made, such as having an open shower where you can actually dine. And that's important. Uh, so there are some elements that help with separation, such as the curtain. Um, obviously, the sun moves vertically in the tropics, so there is these very intense shadows that are drawn into that space. And that, that's what qualifies the interior. Basically, the contact with this really sophisticated garden and, the, and whatever of those effects can come into, into the interior. That's the old pine that I mentioned. This is the square house. This is, uh, I always wanted to do a square house because, I don't know, it's so difficult <laughs> to do a square plan, uh, 60, 8 by 8, 64 square meters, a kind of, one of these kind of classic problems. Um, the steel elements, they were done with uh, milk tank welders. Uh, we got the best finishes. Uh, metal craftsmanship, maybe it's not the best in that area, but again, remember this is a milk region. They, and milk tanks, they need to be certified, the weldings, for hygiene. So we discovered that once you train them a little bit to, this, to do furniture, you can get incredible craftsmanship because they know how to do weldings for these tanks. Another important decision that is important for our work is that there is no hierarchy between the floors outside, such as a sidewalk or a garden, and the deepest, most intimate interior, such as a bathroom. It's the same. So details repeat outside and in the shower. It's the same kind. You can wash this house with a hose but you would also feel that kind of space being kind of repeated outside. So details repeat outside and in. It's not just this kind of modern idea of uh, transparency. It's, about, it's, it's a little bit more raw in the sense that we are trusting that you can actually have the same finishes and not having these transitions that you often have, you know, that you have concrete outside, then you have this thing when you enter and then wood and then some other material that gets more and more refined as you get into the house. Um, that's the retention wall house, again, and this is the interior of the square house. Um, very difficult to design furniture for a house like that, or to buy furniture. But again, because of earthquakes, the structure needs to be very robust. So, uh, the beams are so tall that they can serve as seating. So, um, this sunken space, that's basically the the beams that are necessary to cantilever in all directions from the central column, and that's enough for the seating. Um, so it basically only needs uh, cautions. This is probably you panic if you see this in, when you see this in Europe. Is condensation? <laughs> condensation is really welcome in this project uh, and enjoy. And it's basically about separating the window slightly. This is the bathroom windows. That steel piece that is very robust is the structure of the window. It's also for placing the soap, and it's also the ventilation. Condensation that just runs through. Um, so it's, it's basically where the ventilation happens. And, um, so it's, it's very intense in that sense. I think I'm going to end <laughs> just images of the gardens and the relationship between the houses and the gardens. Really beautiful. There are wild orchids in that region. Uh, some cannot be purchased. The ones that can be purchased are, of course, expensive. Orchids are expensive <laughs> everywhere. But some of the wild orchids, and we could take the time to be very delicate in that sense, to borrow some plants from up on the mountain and really curate the garden in order to qualify this, this architecture. I will end with this one. Thank you. Thank you.